Hello and welcome to the Driver Hire podcast. My name's Tony from Driver Hire Croydon and Sutton. Hello, I'm Gary from Driver Hire in Colchester. We represent two of Driver Hire Nationwide's network of over 100 offices and we decided to get together to create a series of regular podcasts for people who want to know more about driver hire, but principally to provide hints, tips and tricks to help our drivers be the very best that they can be. Hi Gary, how are you doing? Very good Tony, nice to see you again this week. Yes, likewise, yes. Um, so this week Gary is a little bit different because um, it is... National Lorry Week. Yes, something I've always believed in and doing and trying to support. I've tried doing it with the clients in the past, and I hope this podcast will come across some some interesting facts about the lorry. Yes, exactly. So, so, so what we've uh, what we've agreed to do is um, we, we, we've we've got some facts. We've got some well. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure our listeners will decide if they're interested. But we've got some interesting facts um, uh, about lorries that people perhaps might not know. Some of mine are a bit tenuous, Gary, um, but, um, but we haven't we haven't shared these. We're going to have a game of um, kind of lorry top trumps here and uh, and see if we can um, challenge each other to some interesting facts about lorries. I'll kick us off with a first fact, Gary. And seeing as it is National Lorry Week, I've been on the RHA's National Lorry Week website. And I've taken my first fact, as, which is their headline. And that is that 98% of our essential consumer goods are moved by lorry. That's a phenomenal amount. Um, I was looking at some stats as well, and I can't believe how much food is moved by the lorry. It's a phenomenal amount. Well, uh, I kind of, um, and this is going to sound a bit odd, but I think 98% is a low number. And that is because if you just think about it for a moment, just sort of in your mind's eye take a take a walk around your house and just um just try and think of something that you own other than the water that's come out of the tap something that that's in your house right now that's never been on a lorry in its life i, I can't think of one thing in my house no that's very true i'm sitting here thinking tony and it's hard to think at the best of times um <laughs> and no i can't think I don't know if it's because it's they're taking into the van side of things and um, that's not con- taken into consideration. Um, no. I've been looking at lots of figures like yourself and it's very hard to get down to the true percentage of what actually is moved. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, I, yeah, obviously, if you grow your own veg in your garden, of course, that that's that's something that will will probably never go on a lorry in its life. But um, but I, I struggle to think of anything that, that won't at some point in the supply chain have been on a lorry. Okay, so that's that's my opening fact. <laughs> Your go. Okay, I'm going to drag our memories back a little bit further than I think either of us will know. Is when did HGV become a HGV? Because it wasn't always known as a heavy goods vehicle. So I went onto the DVSA website and found out a little bit on the history of when a lorry became a lorry. So what was a lorry before it was a lorry? <laughs> um, I don't really know that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I wouldn't even know where to where to guess a number on that. I mean, I'm assuming it would be um, sort of back between the wars or something like that. Okay. Um, 1934 is the first time we done a, um, a voluntary test or asked for a license for a HGV. Okay, okay. Um, and it was voluntary at the beginning, and it would then worked on. It did stop for the war years, then it came back in in 1946. Okay. Uh, right, my uh, my next fact for you, Gary. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it into a triv question for you. So, Trucker's favourite film, Smokey and the Bandit, was the right. second the second highest grossing film of 1977. Second only to what? Convoy. <laughs> no. No. 1977. Jaws. Oh, close. No. I think no, you've got me now. Star Wars. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, so Smoking the Man, it's second highest grossing film of 1977. I love that film. I've seen it uh, easily a dozen times. No, that is a good film. Um, right, oh, I've got to try and outdo that one. This fact, I'm hoping, isn't going to be too dull. Um, a lot of goods are moved by container when they arrive into the UK. And on the back of the container... 
are a load of numbers and digits, and they all mean something. Okay. And um, but I've just got to pick up a couple of bits at the to highlight because there's just so much information on the vacuum container, and that is really dull. Um, but the main part parts are the first four letters are the first three is to do with the shipping company. MSC would be the Mediti Shipping Company. And then there's always the letter U, and it always ends in U, and it stands for unit. Okay. Okay. And then there's um, a set of numbers, and there's a check number at the end. And the check number is all divided by one company in Switzerland that dishes out the containers with these numbers, so there is not a duplicate container number out there in the whole world. Ah, so individual registration number for every single shipping container. Every single shipping container. I didn't look up the fact how many containers are out there, <laughs> and I dare say there are multi millions. <laughs> yes. Okay. Right. So, I have a. My next fact is that um, when we when we've got an Arctic driving down the road, we always refer to the trailer as, like I've just done, a trailer. Um, but in actual fact, the correct terminology for it is a semi trailer. And in pretty much all other parts of the world, they call it a semi, not a trailer. So they abbreviate semi-trailer to semi. We've abbreviated it to trailer. But to be technically correct, a uh, a trailer is a trailer that supports all of its own weight and is towed behind a, uh, an, a, a vehicle. But a semi-trailer is called a semi-trailer because it carries some of its own weight and some of that weight is um, born by the cab. So I think you know an interesting fact that's going to go with that, Gary. Yep. Um, it's literally eight years ago to the week. You taught me this fact, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Why is a fifth wheel called a fifth wheel? Now, I know you've just explained to me the fa fact, but I think you explained this so well. I've got to throw this back to you because <laughs> I found this fact really interesting. Yeah. And We've just done a video about how to use a ratchet strap and we used a driver um, from another company to help us do some other videos and so on. And he actually knew this fact as well. So it just confirms it is a true fact, Tony, that you told me eight years ago. I've been telling everyone since. Uh, well, we know it's a true fact because it's in the um, it's in the transport um, uh, manager CPC. But I will I will share I will share the fact <laughs> <laughs> that um, a semi trailer. So one of those trailers that that that's behind an Arctic, 80% of its load is borne by its own trailer wheels and 20% of its load is borne by the tractor unit. And of course, 20% in fractions is one fifth and, and, the, and the weight is, is being carried on that fifth wheel. So the fifth wheel is called a fifth wheel because it carries one fifth of the weight of the trailer. And, uh, and if, if there's anybody listening to this podcast who's thinking, you trucking geeks, I've got no idea what you're talking about. If you ever see a tractor unit with no trailer on, it's that big, black, greasy plate that's sitting on the back of the uh, tractor unit to, uh, that receives the trailer. Yep, looks nothing like a fifth wheel. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Give us another fact then, Tony. Okay, I've got um, a slightly different one, a bit less geeky. Well, I don't know. The longest ramp jump in a lorry measured 50.6 metres, so 166 feet, and was uh, was completed by a, uh, a guy called Greg Godfrey in You Won't Be Surprised to Hear in the USA. It was at an Evil Knievel Days event in uh, Montana in uh, 2015. But the previous record holder was this same guy, and his previous record was 15 metres, which is long enough. <laughs> but see, beat his own record by thirty-five meters. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be airborne in a truck at all, let alone for fifty meters. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay. Next fact for me is: Ooh, have a look at my list. To become a HGV driver, you have to be eighteen. Now, mm -hmm. did you know when it changed from twenty-one to eighteen? Oh, blimey. I remember it changing. The thing about getting old, Gary, is every time you try and recollect a period of time, it's normally about double what you think it is. So on the basis that I think it's about 10 years ago, it's probably about 20 years ago. Well, well you're closer with the 10. It's 2009. OK, OK. Um, I mean, I'm not adverse to young guys coming through the industry and everything else. But the hardest thing we have in this area, and I, I would guess it's the same across the country, 
is anyone under 25 is an issue for insurance. Mm. So an 18-year-old passing the HGV, he'll go out and do a good job. He's quite happy to stay in the industry, but it's very hard to get him on the insurance for people. Um, so that it, now we've changed to 18, I don't see a huge benefit of that for everyone across the country at this moment in time. Yeah, I guess it, it takes um, a forward-thinking employer and a and a kind of a maybe an apprenticeship scheme to to you know to to, to bring somebody through um, in a in a more I don't know if protective way is the right word that I'm looking for, but but yeah, it, it is a problem in terms of the insurance trying to get young guys through. Which actually, interesting, leads me to another fact I have for you. Oh. <laughs> Which is about um, you know, sectors of society that that aren't commonly driving trucks, and that would be women. So, in the UK currently, just one and a half percent of lorry drivers are women. But I looked at um, I, you know, I wondered if that trend was was changing. Um, so I looked at the test pass data for last year, and last year there were um, seventy, well, just over seventy thousand HGV tests taken of which 41,000 were passes. So that's 41, well, 41,434 new people entered the industry last year, which is great. But of those test passes, 10.4% were women. So that tells me that the trend is towards there being more women in the industry, which is, which is great news. And on the back of that fact, I'd just like to chuck in a little apology because I don't know if you've noticed, but every single time you or I talk about one of our drivers, we always say he. And and that's that's not sexism on my part. It's simply that as of today, I, I, I literally have not one female driver. I have had uh, uh, female HGV drivers working for us and some very good ones at that. But I don't have any at the moment. So apologies if anybody's picked up on the fact that we always say he well, we probably should say they. <laughs> You, you, you're spot on, Tony. Um, I go up and down the amount of um, women working for me. I currently have one HGV, one doing, um, I'm trying to think what, what job she's on. It's a tipper lorry she's on at the moment. So just having the one lady of my 50 HGV drivers, um, she's 2%. So it actually falls much in line with the um, figures you quoted earlier. Mm. But the, the test past data tells us that the trend coming for the future is that there's more women in the industry and, you know, great, brilliant. No, not a bad thing. We've got plenty of work they can come and do as well. Um, and I've had the most I've had is three. Mm. I had a nice photograph of Shani with the three ladies in the office in the past. Uh, and that was um, to do with the ladies in driving week. Oh, right. I've got to just carry on with the fact you've gone there, Tony, about how many people pass their test and so on, which is much higher than I thought it was. Um, how many HGV drivers are registered to carry on driving this moment in time in the country? Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm going to stick my neck out with a guess. I would say there are half a million HGV licence holders in the UK. No, you, you, you're about right with the back. There's about 480,000. Oh, that was really good then. <laughs> yeah, but of them 480,000, is only 320,000 actually driving this moment in time. Oh, okay. That, I got that from the Auto Transport February 2020 for me figures from that one. Um, but I, then I was trying to find another fact to go with that. What I also I found out, Tony, um, and this was the hardest fact of everything trying to find out, is how many HGVs are registered in the UK? There is just so much information out there. And sometimes they included seven and a half, sometimes they didn't. Um, but I got to the figure of 273,000 are currently registered in the UK in 2019. Okay. okay. So with our 320,000 drivers, there don't seem to be a shortage on paper. But we also remember some of them vehicles are working 24 hours a day as well. Yeah, I was just thinking that as you said it. So so you quite often have a situation like a an RDC, so a regional distribution centre for, for a... Um, uh, let's say a supermarket or something, um, or you could have, well, RDCs or anything really, but but yeah, you quite often have a vehicle that could be working double shift every single day. So that's 14 shifts a week. And that would need about, well, two and a half, three drivers to to run that vehicle for the week, wouldn't it? With the driver's hours rules. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, but it's very hard to work out where I've always heard, well, we've always got a shortage of HGV, but these figures I've got, um, mm. if there is generally shortage. But you've got holidays to take into consideration, sickness and everything else. 
Mm. And and how many double or triple shifted vehicles there are? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Um, I have um, I've got a geeky fact. <laughs> um, so my geeky fact is that generally speaking, if you've got a small class two vehicle um, and you've got a seven and a half ton vehicle, and they can look pretty similar in size, but a good way of spotting the difference is to count the wheel nuts. So. Uh -huh. So a seven and a half ton vehicle will generally have six stud wheels and a class two vehicle will generally have 10 stud wheels. Ah, I've always, as training when I've had new people work in the office, I've always gone by the size of the tyre. Look, That looks much bigger and much smaller, trying to keep it simple. But I've never done, knew the fact about the number of studs. So that's a new one to me as well. Yeah, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not exhaustive because there are, there are some exceptions. But in general, uh, that, that, that's the rule. Good. OK, um, another one for when things changed and, and to the benefit as well, I think it's changed is um, back in 1985, we started using tachographs. Ah, yes. And I was trying to find out the exact figures of when accidents did drop because of tachographs. Mm -hmm. um, but after 1990, there's very little information I can find, but um, there I did find something in the government figures that it did drop between 1985 to 1990, the number of HGVs involved in accidents. So yeah. hopefully that has improved the tiredness and everything else. So the guys and girls out there aren't so tired and they are taking the break when they should be. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so when I started um, driving, it was that, that old waxed card tachograph and it, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, must be, even then must have been hundred year old technology in terms of a, a, a stylus scraping a wax card. So, so these are, if anybody's ne never used one or never seen one, what we're talking about is a, is a thin waxed card about the size of a, of a compact disc. Mind you, people might not know what a compact disc is anymore, <laughs> about a five inch diameter wax card. And, and you would literally have a, a key at the top of your speedometer. Um, and you turn that, flop it forward and and clip this wax card on the back uh, and then shut the shut the shut that the, the the speedometer back up and and then it would last one revolution 24 hours um, and would record the the um the work mode the distance and the speed that you're driving at at any given time but i didn't realize or i hadn't really thought about the fact that they're only just in real terms been introduced before yeah, just before i started driving but before that of course was the log book wasn't it so there was there was drivers that i'd meet at the time that were used to log books and a, and a log book and they'd li literally write down what they'd done for the day and they could write pretty much anything down yeah th there was no way of proving it was there no no so um we've come a long way we are on digital tachographs and have been for some time and a, yeah. a far far better way of doing things and 2006, that was my other fact of leading on the digitacographs. They came in, and I remember going on a training course in 2006 on how to use one. So my, um, so my last fact, Gary, um, is, um, is about the fastest truck in the world. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting anybody would ever want to travel at this speed in any kind of vehicle, maybe apart from a jet plane. But, um, but this is a jet-powered truck called the Shockwave. And they, and they do sort of uh, um, demonstration drives on drag strips and stuff in the States, as you would imagine. Um, so the fastest truck in the world, the Shockwave, can travel at 376 miles an hour. And this jet engine on the back is, is so powerful uh, that whenever they do one of these demonstration drives with it, they have to resurface the road afterwards because it melts the tarmac when it, when it shoots off down the, uh, down the strip. That is unbelievable. <laughs> they, they definitely don't want to go down the autobahn in Germany with that. They wouldn't be very happy. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, well, um, well, that's brilliant. Um, Gary, thank you so much. It's been a bit of a bit of a different episode today. And um, clearly we've done that to, to celebrate uh, National Lorry Week. Our jobs, of course, wouldn't exist without the lorry because um, that's what we do, finding drivers. But when you realise that 98% of consumer goods are, are moved by lorry at some point in that in that goods journey then you can see just how essential they are for, for the country and the economy oh very much so um people forget unless you're in this industry how important a lorry is to us for getting everything out there 
if you're in the industry, you tend to love it and enjoy it. And I can't think anything better than Love the Lorry Week. Mm, brilliant. So if you have enjoyed it, please do rate, review and subscribe. Um, and we'll look forward to speaking to you next week. And I hope you like the facts. Me and Tony got a little side bet on here. The person who's got the most interesting fact wins a really nice bottle of drink. <laughs> yes, yes. Tell us, tell us in the comments uh, that my fact was the best one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gary. We'll, um, uh, we'll catch up soon. Thank you. Speak soon. Cheers, Tony. You've been listening to the Driver Hire podcast, and thank you very much. And as goodbye from myself, Gary Richards at the Colchester office. And from me, Tony Gosher from the Croydon and Sutton office. If you'd like to get in touch with us, along with all the other driver hire offices, you can find us at driverhire.co.uk. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye.